It is now time for a question period. The, the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Um, Premier, in light of the gas plant uh, scandal and the billion one wasted to save Liberal seats uh, to uh, cancel the Oakville gas plant, we asked the House to sit longer to debate that. You refused to do so. Uh, and I'm also worried that you're reneging on our deal. Uh, a month or so ago, you and I sat down in your office. We agreed to clear the decks on legislation that was not really focused on jobs and the economy in large part. So that would pave the way for you to put forward your jobs plan. You have to see that plan. You've moved from tanning bed legislation now to restaurant menus, yeah. but I've not seen anything when it comes to jobs or balancing the books in the province. I wrote you a follow-up letter and asking if we could sit down so I could see your plan. So let me ask you, Premier, bottom line, Question? why are, rene are you reneging on our deal? Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, we did have that conversation, and the conversation went like this. I suggested that there were some pieces of legislation that we could move ahead with, that we could find agreement on, Mr. Speaker, so that we could continue to have debates about some other things that maybe we didn't agree on, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things that we don't agree on is the path forward, because I think what the Leader of the Opposition is suggesting, Mr. Speaker, is that we, we would adopt his plan to slash and cut public services in this province, Mr. Speaker, and that's not what we're going to do. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to invest in people, we're going to invest in infrastructure, and we're going to invest in a business climate that is going to create jobs, Mr. Speaker. And for example, we've committed $17.6 million to support regions and businesses in this province, Mr. Speaker. That's leveraged over $133.1 million in investments, and it's created or retained nearly 2,800 jobs, Mr. Speaker. So that's just one piece of the work that we are doing. Yes, and in fact, the Leader of the Opposition didn't support that strategy for regional uh, encouragement of jobs, Mr. Speaker, and I, that is confusing at best. Thank you. Before we move on, uh, just as a comment, I will not allow shouting people down anymore. Supplementary. Um, you, you know, the Premier, what, uh, maybe there's some confusion. I thought we had agreed we'd clear the deck so you could bring forward your jobs plan. Um, it seems like you wanted to clear the deck so you could bring forward legislation around restaurant menus as opposed to our vision, which is paving the way for more jobs and more opportunity for Ontarians. Premier, a million people began this week with, with no job to go to. They're losing hope in this great province. And I worry that your, your ideology blinds you to the challenges we face or what's necessary to turn our economy around. You know that if interest rates go up, that that will put another $500 million of debt interest, taking away our ability to hire more nurses or do more MRI. So, Premier, clearly you ran to be Premier for some reason other than to have that office. It has been nine months of endless study, conversations and consultations. Where is the big plan? Where are the ideas? Where is the hope and opportunity? We've got that plan. You're welcome to see it. Just ask it. Where is hope? Premier. Mr. Speaker, so on top of the regional development strategy, which has created or has helped 2,800 jobs, Mr. Speaker, I, th I would suggest that the Leader of the Opposition talk to some of the folks who work in the Ford plant, Mr. Speaker, because yeah. that's $70.9 million investment in the Ford plant yeah. that will protect more than 2,800 jobs and allow Ford to take part in global trade, Mr. Speaker. I think he would want to support that. He also might want to talk to people in small businesses who understand that the Supporting Small Businesses Act is going to help them with their payroll, Mr. Speaker, is going to allow them to hire more people. Those are actions that we're taking along with the Local Food Act that will encourage and support more jobs in the agri-food sector, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Waste Reduction Act, which will create jobs. So all of those are part of our strategy to make investments Answer. in people and in infrastructure and in a business climate that will allow the private sector to create jobs. That is happening, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Supplementary. Premier, we put a plan on the table to create over 300,000 jobs, good jobs in, in manufacturing, to get energy prices under control, to lower taxes, to change the attitude of government, to get out of the way of business, stop always be standing in the way of job creation and get behind so we'll invest and create jobs again. And all I hear from you is more warmed over old NDP ideas that, quite frankly, got us into a deep ditch back in the 1990s. Let me ask you this at least. It's been a month since we agreed to clear the decks you brought forward no plan. 
I wrote to you almost three weeks ago. You've not responded to my letter to meet to discuss your plan as of yet. I'm worried that you have no plan. So, so will you stand in the House today? I know the economic statement is coming shortly. Will that be a game changer for that province? Will that be a moment of no. truth? Will it actually? Will we finally see the Kathleen Vision vision? Kathleen Wynn vision. That was a tough one. You've got to rehearse it more often. Got to try that one more often. Will we actually see what your plan is? Because you only have two moments: a budget and an economic statement every year. You waste the budget. So please, it's got to be the economic statement. You see it, please. You see it, please. I suspect that there was a reason why you fumbled over because he knows that we're not supposed to use proper names in here, and I think that's what was the problem. You stumbled over it. So I'm going to remind all members, please uh, use either title or writing. Thank you when referring in the House. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, but I am not offended by the leader of the, of the opposition calling me by my first name. Mr. Speaker, what our fall economic statement will not do is it will not adopt the Conservatives' agenda, which will fire 10,000 education workers, Mr. Speaker, fire 2,000 health care workers, Mr. Speaker, drive wages down with harmful right to work legislation. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex, come to order. The member from uh, Northumberland. No, I, I was thinking of whether I should or shouldn't, but I will. Northumberland, Quinty West. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, we will not adopt that plan that we believe would undermine the progress of the province. Mr. Speaker, would not provide for a future of well-educated workers. Mr. Speaker, would not create an environment where investment wants to come to this province. That is what is happening now, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Jobs are being created. We are investing in a business climate that's innovative and dynamic, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Speaker, my question this morning is for the finance minister. Minister, our party has cleared the decks so you can present your jobs plan to the legislature. Minister, we're still waiting to see it. You've been in office for nine months, held 100 conversations, created 32 panels, and yet there's still no plan to create jobs and kickstart our economy. But your jobs plan isn't the only thing that's AWOL, Minister. The Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act, which your government passed, states, quote, Within two years after each provincial election, the minister shall release a long-range assessment of Ontario's fiscal environment. Minister, you're two weeks late. When will you be releasing this assessment that you were legally required to release Question. two weeks ago? Thank you. Minister well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the fact that the member opposite is actually interested in knowing how to increase and promote economic growth in our great province. He recognizes that we have achieved results. He knows fully well that we've had a plan that's working, Mr. Speaker. We have 180 percent return of those jobs that were suffered during the recession. We are the top jurisdiction around the world exceeding our targets. We are the lowest cost government in all of Canada at all orders of government. We have the most competitive tax regime to stimulate investment and it is working. We have a fall economic statement that's coming out shortly. We produce first quarter results that achieves our, 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 our opportunities and it shows the success that we've had to date. And public accounts, audited public accounts, show yes, that we exceed our targets. We are coming forward with a long-term plan beyond the election cycle politics that the opposition wants to, want to play. We're not going there, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, that assessment isn't optional. You're legislated to do this, and the Act spells out the specific areas this assessment is to report on. Your predecessors actually did meet this requirement, but apparently you can't. You're running afoul of your own government's law, but then again, we've seen the deleted gas plants emails that breaking the law seems to be nothing new over on this side. Maybe you're working hard behind the scenes to get creative with the numbers, like you did on the gas plant, to hide your wa failed wage freeze, which we exposed last week. Minister, in nine months, you've put forward no plan to create jobs, no plan to stimulate the economy, and no plan to balance the budget. Do you have any plan at all to present your long-term fiscal assessment? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, not only do we have a plan, we have results that are working according to that plan. Order, please. 
Order. Minister. And the plan has been outlined a number of times, which the opposition choose not to read. What we will say, and in the, in the upcoming fall economic statement, we'll highlight some of those issues. But what the opposition must recognize is that what they talk about is actually a destructive plan. And we will not take extreme views of across the board cuts that will harm the sensitive recovery of our province. We have taken measures of austerity to a point that's necessary, but now we must stimulate economic growth. We will continue to invest in people. We're going to continue to invest in infrastructure, and we're going to continue, Mr. Speaker, to ensure our economy grows by taking on trade. Final supplementary. Speaker, Minister, let's recap the last nine months. There's no jobs plan, no plan to stimulate the economic growth, no plan to balance the budget, and no long-term assessment. It's clear that you're not up to the job on this file, Minister. It only stands to reason that Ontarios can expect another whole lot of nothing when you present your fall economic statement. You've shown through the gas plant scandal that your government has a lot of trouble with numbers. And the least you can do is use this opportunity to finally lay out a plan to get more, the, the more than 500,000 men and women who woke up this morning without a job back to work. Minister, it's obvious your fall economic statement won't have a real jobs plan. Will you take our plan, our 14 white papers, and use our ideas to put Ontario back to work? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, if we recall their plan, their plan was to hide a huge deficit. Their plan was to sell assets at fire sale. Their plan was to give it away, Mr. Speaker. Their plan left a legacy of an energy problem that we're still paying for today. We have taken control. We have invested in our province. We're investing in our people. We're investing in infrastructure, and we're creating a climate of economic growth and business development with innovation. We're going to continue on that positive plan, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to fall prey to what they're proposing. That's right. Thank you. Question, Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. News reports indicate that the Premier is creating yet another panel. This time, the conversation will focus on so-called open government. If the Premier is interested in openness, Speaker, will she commit today to returning to the Justice Committee to explain her role in the decision that handed over a billion dollars to a private power company? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I haven't received an invitation from the committee. Um, if the member has a question, I'd be happy to answer that question. But I just, I just want to uh, say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, I, I need to know what the new information is that the uh, that the member is seeking, because I've accepted responsibility as a member of the cabinet that made the decision, Mr. Speaker. I have apologized a number of times. I've explained my role at every step of the process. I've explained every interaction that I've had, Mr. Speaker. I've explained my understanding of the cost. Uh, Estimates that were provided by officials. I appeared at the committee on April 30th. I've answered 207 questions in the House, Mr. Speaker. I've responded to the AG report. I responded the day that it was tabled. So I've done all of that, Mr. Speaker. I haven't received an invitation, as I say. I would. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions if the answer. member has a specific question. Supplementary. Speaker, people learned that liberal waste is costing them 1.1 billion dollars, and the auditor tied that cost to decisions signed off by this Premier. The Premier wants to have a conversation about open government, but people want some answers about the sky-high price of electricity that they're paying in this province. Will the Premier come to the Justice Committee and explain why she was signing a document that was helping private power companies guarantee their profits and putting families and businesses on the hook? Good question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I have explained my role in that process, Mr. Speaker. I have explained it in this House, and I have explained it at committee. And as I say, I have a number of times explained my whole interaction and my whole role in the process, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that when I came into this office, I said that we were going to open up the process, and that is exactly what we did, Mr. Speaker. So in fact, my commitment to open government is an expression of a belief that I have always held and that has been manifested by the fact that I have 
attended the committee, that I have opened up the process. We broadened the scope of the committee, and we've provided thousands of documents, Mr. Speaker, in answer to the questions that have been asked by committee. So, the questions that the leader of the third party are asking are questions that have been asked over and over and over again, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and they have been answered over and over and over again. If there is a new question, if there is new information that's being sought, Thank I would you. like to hear that, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. You know, Speaker, the Premier has claimed that she doesn't want to have this kind of thing happen again in Ontario, and I can tell her neither do Ontarians, Speaker. They're tired of watching their bills go up and up and up, and they want to know why, Speaker. People want to understand. They want to understand why the Premier was signing off on decisions that the auditor said clearly favoured private power companies. Will the Premier be coming to the committee to explain why she did that? Again, Mr. Speaker, I have answered that question. I've talked about the, my role in the, uh, in the cabinet walk around that happened, Mr. Speaker, and I have taken responsibility for being part of a government that was in a process and was trying to avoid litigation, Mr. Speaker. We've talked. Uh, I, I'm probably going to ask the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek the, the same question I would ask him if he was in his seat, and that is to come to order, please. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I spoke uh, week before last about the advice that we were given, that officials advised us that waiting to relocate the plant could have been more expensive and that, that renegotiating was more prudent than ripping up the agreement, Mr. Speaker, and so we were engaged in that process. But the point is, I have taken responsibility as a member of Cabinet for that decision, Mr. Speaker. I have Answer. articulated my role. and. That'll get you thrown out. If you want to start doing that, I'll start throwing. Finish, please. Ten seconds. Just, Mr. Speaker, and just to say that we have provided 175,000 pages of documents and answers to all of the questions that have been asked. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Well, thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. The Premier loves conversation, and she has the panels to prove it, Speaker. Now there are 30 groups looking at everything from new tolls and taxes to undoing the damage to the horse racing industry. Now the Premier is saying she Order wants a panel on openness. Will she show commitment to openness, Speaker, by coming to the Justice Committee and explaining why she signed off on a decision that clearly favoured a private power company? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, uh, apart from the tone of the question, I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I think it's very, very important that government pay attention to people's opinions, that we engage with people, Mr. Speaker, that we get feedback from people outside of government. And so that is how I have operated as a politician. That is how I will operate as a premier. So whether the leader of the third party thinks it's important or not to have people with expertise give us advice, we do believe it's important, Mr. Speaker. We think that it's a very good thing to have people who understand a particular sector or a particular issue, as a, for, as an for an example, the open government process. I think it's a good thing for them to give us advice on engagement with the public, and I look forward to that process, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, gee, Speaker, maybe the Premier and the Liberals should have been listening to the Council in Oakville back in March of 2009 when they passed a resolution trying to block Ontario families are looking for some real answers about their sky-high hydro bills, not conversation after conversation after conversation. Ontario's Auditor General specifically raised a decision that the Premier was part of in her report on the Oakville gas plant. This government has created such a mess in energy planning that the Premier was signing documents that gave private power companies huge advantages instead of protecting families who pay the bills. Will the Premier be returning to the Justice Committee to explain why she was a part of a decision that gave private power companies the upper hand, or is her new openness panel just another smokescreen speaker? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just, I, I just want to say to the leader of the, uh, the third party that, you know, I agree with her. And I have said many, many times that had we paid better attention, had we had a better upfront process in the location of those gas plants, Mr. Speaker, then we would not have made the mistakes that were made. And I've said that quite openly, that having a better community process is part of what needed to happen and needs to happen going forward. And that's why we're putting a new process in place, Mr. Speaker. As for the Justice Committee, I haven't received an invitation, 
Mr. Speaker. But I have been to the Justice Committee. I have answered many, many questions in the House and at committee. I have explained my role, Mr. Speaker. And if there is new information that's sought, I would be happy to answer that question, Mr. Speaker. But I have been there, and I have not yet received another invitation. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, fixing a community process is never going to get rid of the Liberals' uh, penchant for their own self-interest ahead of the interests of Ontarians. That's what Liberals do all the time. Last week, Ontarians found out that they had seen their ele electricity bills, going to see their electricity bills rather, keep growing faster than the rate of inflation in this province. It's getting harder for them to pay the bills already, and they deserve the answer, Speaker. They deserve to know why the Premier gave up legal protections for ratepayers and gave the upper hand to the private power company. Will the Premier come to the Gas Plants Committee and explain her decision to protect the interests of private power companies instead of the interests of people and businesses who are stuck paying the highest hydro bills in this country? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I have said, I have been to the committee and I have answered many, many questions, and I have not received an invitation from the committee at this point. But, Mr. Speaker, when we came into office, the energy system in this province was in disarray, Mr. Speaker. It had been left in disarray. There were huge investments needed in distribution, Mr. Speaker. The capacity and the generation capacity was not what it needed to be, Mr. Speaker. We have made huge improvements, Mr. Speaker, in the. Up the clock, please. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will receive the same advice or the question that I asked the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. If you were in your seat, I'd tell you the same thing I'm going to tell you now. Come to order. She's asking. She's answering. So, Mr. Speaker, the investments that we have made in the energy system has, have made it more stable, Mr. Speaker, and it's work that absolutely had to be done. As far as our commitment to green energy, Mr. Speaker, that we are leaders in terms of the North American continent and making sure that we have clean, renewable energy going forward, Mr. Speaker. So, I'm proud of our record. I have said clearly that there were mistakes that were made, and contrary to what the third Answer. leader of the third party is saying, I do believe that a better community process actually produces a better outcome, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're putting one Thank in place. Question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, you sat at the Cabinet table and signed the document which authorized your Liberal government to waste over $1 billion of taxpayer money to cancel two power plants. Over the past eight months, you have stated that your government reacted out of respect for the local community's opposition to these power plants. Depends on where the community if you haven't noticed, 73 municipalities in Ontario have declared themselves unwilling hosts, but despite, despite your promises, wind projects continue to be approved for communities who do not want them. Since when did a person's postal code determine whether they receive respect or contempt from your government? No About 200 tractors, excuse me, to, I was out in the rain with these folks on the weekend. About 200 tractors, Question. trucks, and cars made their way down a 30 kilometer stretch of Highway 402 to get to your attention. Premier, will you Thank recognize you. that all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the member opposite absolutely makes the point that I was making in answer to, in response to the leader of the third party, which is that it is very important to have a good community process. And the process that the Minister of Energy is putting in place, which, uh, which identifies willing hosts and gives communities more input into the process up front, Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what needs to happen. And I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the work that we did on green energy has been very, very positive. And there is a lot to learn from the process that perhaps didn't take community. If it's a test, I'll pass it. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You know what they say, those who can do, those who can't consult and have conversations. Enough is enough. Your government, with the support of the NDP, has lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs because of your botched green energy policies. And you have the audacity to announce another t rate hike as of November 1st. Last Friday, I have to tell you, Premier, my constituency assistant helped a family of seven. Their electricity had been cut off.
because they could not afford to pay their hydro bill. The mother called my office frantic because she had five small children and we had the threat of snow this past weekend in my riding. Thankfully, on a Friday afternoon, we were able to arrange to get the hydro back on. But for how long? Premier, where are you taking this province? Truthfully, I am dreading this winter if you are all the people who cannot afford their hydro bills. Premier, is this what you envisioned for Ontario when you took over this role? And are we Thank to you. expect families not Thank to receive you. the basic? Yeah. 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 You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Let's not get wound up before I even get a chance to have her stand. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that we have rebuilt over 80 per cent of our electricity system because— The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, is warned. Carry on. That rebuild of 80 per cent of the electricity system had to happen, Mr. Speaker, because when we came into office, it was not reliable, it had been neglected, and that work needed to be done. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, our plan for green energy has eliminated dirty coal, Mr. Speaker. It's created more than 31,000 jobs. The member from Sonia Lambton is warned. <coughs> Carry on. And it's generated $24 billion in investments, Mr. Speaker. So I, I absolutely take to heart, and I'm glad that the, the member opposite was able to work with, uh, with her constituent to make sure that her constituent had power. But that power is available, Mr. Speaker, because we, we've reworked the energy system yes, and we have the capacity to provide that electricity. Question. The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, this government dealt a, a death blow to the horse racing industry under the pretext of OLG modernization. OLG modernization is simply a liberal code for more casinos. But Ontarians have been very clear that they don't want casinos in their communities. Last week, the city of Vaughan voted to reject being a host site for a casino, and now the doors are quickly shutting to the possibility of a casino anywhere in the GTA. Will the Premier listen to the communities and the people of Ontario and admit that OLG modernization is a giant, total, abysmal failure? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, the, and I appreciate the question, and I appreciate the premise of the question, recognizing some of the, the concerns that exist going forward with regards to the transformation of the OLG and our gaming. We recognize how important to be socially responsible. We recognize also the great uh, degree of dividend and support that the OLG provides for schools and hospitals and investments in our communities. We also appreciate and respect municipal decisions, and that's what we've done all along. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The slots and racetrack program brought in $1.1 billion a year in government revenue. By cancelling the SARP, this government has destroyed an entire industry in southern and rural Ontario for the profit of big casino conglomerates. But Ontarians don't want casinos in their communities. They want racetracks. Isn't it time to admit you made a mistake? Reinstate the slots at racetrack program until you figure out a fair and transparent plan for horse racing and casinos in Ontario. Mr. Finance, Minister of Agriculture and Food, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Agriculture and Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the plan that we have put in place is an accountable and transparent plan, Mr. Speaker. That's, you know, we owe a lot to uh, the former members, John Snowblin and Elmer Buchanan and John Wilkinson. They have worked with the industry, Mr. Speaker, to put in place put in place a plan that will allow for a sustainable industry. The SARP program was neither transparent nor was it accountable, Mr. Speaker. So it would be irresponsible for us to move back there. But, Mr. Speaker, what we want is a sustainable industry across the province and all of the tracks in the province, Mr. Speaker, whether they're part of the core or whether they're part of the grassroots, will have an opportunity to present a business plan, work with OLG, and have a sustainable future. That was our goal, Mr. Speaker, and that's yes, what we put in place. Your question? The member from Ottawa South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. 
Speaker, the Friday before Thanksgiving, I had the opportunity to join Mayor Watson, members of council, and a number of colleagues from Queen's Park at an event to mark the start of boring the tunnel for Ottawa's light rail project. It was truly an exciting day for Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, even with this exciting news in Ottawa, there's a lot of interest in the transit debate that's happening here in Toronto. In fact, many Ontarians want to know how the government is helping to build the future of transportation infrastructure in the province's largest city. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, residents of Ottawa South want to know how this government is going to help Ottawa move forward. Recently, the Mayor, uh, recently Mayor Watson called for a massive transit plan to get cars off the street and citizens to the places they need to be in an efficient manner. Question. Speaker, to the Minister, what have we done to get Ottawa moving? Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are investing uh, and have invested since we've come to uh, government $1.8 billion in the City of Ottawa. I believe that is an unprecedented investment in that community, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I think that's uh, uh, due to the very hard work of, uh, of a number of, of Liberal MPPs from that constituency, Mr. Speaker, who are delivering for the community. The, the Confederation line, which the member from Ottawa South uh, has been a big champion of, Mr. Speaker, is moving forward. It's a very significant uh, contribution, Mr. Speaker. It is part of over a billion dollars of investment in rapid transit alone, Mr. Speaker, um, and $600 million just to the bus rapid transit system. Mr. Speaker, we often get asked what the jobs policy is. Th Answer. This investment, Mr. Speaker, is creating 20,000 person years of work in Ottawa and creating the foundation for major, major private sector job creation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's very good news to hear that transportation funding is a priority and that projects are underway in Ottawa. Res residents of Ottawa South will be glad to know that this government is helping municipalities like Ottawa to build the transit we need. There are many small to mid-sized cities that need a steady flow of funding to finance transit infrastructure. I know that we are committed to assisting all regions and all cities to get every single Ontarian to work and home as fast as possible. Mr. Speaker, it is important to my constituents and to all, Ontari and to all Ontarians in small to mid-sized cities to know that they can count on funding to support their demands for their public transportation system. Can the minister tell us what we're going to Question. do as a government to ensure there is steady funding to help municipalities outside the DPHA? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, if you understand the importance of infrastructure, you just have to look out the windows of the legislature. The biggest. The biggest commercial boom in construction is going on in the history of the city. It is estimated, Mr. Speaker, that half of all the construction cranes in North America are at work right now in the GTHA alone. That is a remarkable record, Mr. Speaker. But it extends beyond Toronto, and I mentioned the huge investments in Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, a small community like Ignace in northwestern Ontario has clean water because of this government rebuilt its water treatment plant, Mr. Speaker. In communities, uh, as small as Burpee and Mills Township, Mr. Speaker, there is $178,000 going to build a critical road uh, in that community that will help revitalize that community, Mr. Speaker. Answer. In Cobalt, almost $2 million is being being invested right now in basic road infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We are building jobs and opportunities across Thank you. Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Martin, Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Premier. As you know, Premier, my Bill 74 takes a firm stand in Good support deal. of Ontario workers and in support of an Ontario company. Premier, on September the 9th, you spoke in support, saying, and I quote, it's about a level playing field, and it's a very good example of the kind of thing Attorney where General. we can find agreement and we should be able to move forward." Unquote. Premier, you were all in. But on October the 2nd, you stated, and I quote, I will not be supporting it, assuming that the decision is not appealed, so that's the decision. Unquote. Well, Premier, you have both flipped and flopped, but the time for clarity is now, and thousands of workers at Elliston are eager for your word. With the decision being officially appealed, Premier, will you, assume, will you resume your support of my important bill, or will you Question. renege on your word in favour of foreign corporations over Ontario workers? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the member opposite knows, the divisional court has made a ruling that quashed the decision of the OLRB, OLRB Mr. Speaker, so the company can continue to operate as it did prior to the OLRB re, re, um, case, Mr. Speaker. So, 
From my perspective, and I have said this because circumstances have changed, the urgency that was created by that Labour Board decision, Mr. Speaker, have, remo have been removed by the Divisional Court decision, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Premier, uh, just to reiterate your quote, you said, I will not be supporting it, assuming that the decision is not appealed. That was your word, Premier. Your lack of leadership and lack of decisiveness has risked an Ontario success story and thousands of Ontario construction jobs. My Bill 74 will maintain the status quo for Ellis Don and will settle this issue once and for all. Premier, you stated that you would not be supporting my bill, assuming— Attorney General will come to order. Second time. Premier, again, you stated that you would not be supporting my bill, assuming it was not appealed. However, despite the appeal, you have chosen to stand with foreign construction companies instead of Ontario workers. Based on your past statements, it is obvious that your government expects the divisional court ruling to hold. Premier, when did you tell the sheet metal workers and the electrical Question. workers that you expect their appeal to fail, and why do you refuse to stand up for Elliston and their thousands of employees all Thank across you. Ontario? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think the uh, member opposite knows full well that there has been no uh, no uh, appeal granted at this point. There's a leave to appeal before the court. We believe that the circumstance. I believe that the circumstances has cha have changed. The divisional court has quashed the ruling by the OLRB, Mr. Speaker. And because of that, I believe that the urgency that was in place because of that uh, that OLRB decision is no longer in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, member from Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last spring, well-connected insiders hired by Ellis Don had legislation crafted so they could es escape a contract they had with their employees. The Conservatives proposed it, but the Liberals enthusiastically supported it, and the Premier agreed to speed it through this very House. Now she's scrambling to distance herself from the very bill that she championed. Can the Premier tell us what today's position is on the Ellis Don bill? Decided. Premier? Not us. I think I just answered this question, Mr. Speaker, but I'm happy to answer it again. As the member opposite knows, the Divisional Court quashed the ruling of the Labour Relations Board, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, the fact that the company uh, can now continue to operate as it did before the OLRB real ruling, Mr. Speaker, I believe changed the circumstances, and uh, we believe that, uh, that the bill is no longer needed and that the urgency that was in place because of the OLRB decision is no longer there. Thank you, Speaker. The the Premier's position on this has more loops and turns than a roller coaster. What's more and more clear is that the Premier will say and do anything to help the Liberal Party. First, she championed the bill, passed it unanimously, and put it on the fast track. Then she tried to convince the unions to abandon their right to appeal. Then, when they called her bluff, she zigzagged again, and now she claims she's going to oppose it. What assurances do people have that the Premier won't flip-flop yet again when the lobbyists from Ellis Don come knocking? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have always believed that if one takes a position under a certain set of circumstances and then those circumstances changed, changed then the intelligent response is to reassess the position, Mr. Speaker. If the circumstances don't change, then you don't need to reassess the position. The circumstances changed, the urgency that was in place is no longer in place, and so, Mr. Speaker, we, I believe that the, that the piece of legislation is no longer required, Mr. Speaker. Your question, a member from Brampton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. The Ontario Provincial Nominee Program, known as the PNP, is a valuable immigrant selection program that allows Ontario to nominate economic immigrants for permanent. Member from Renfrew, residency. that'll do. Newcomers are nominated based. Oh, really? That'll do. Phil, if I have to get louder just because the member refuses to hear what I'm asking, uh, then I will get uh, specific. I've asked him to, to refrain. The member from Renfrew uh, choosing to ignore me? Good. Please finish. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just recently learned that the federal government has capped Ontario's yearly nomination at only 1,300 nominees. I was also surprised to learn that no new PNP applications have been accepted since August. 
Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government ensuring that we select the best and brightest economic immigrants to fill the skilled labour gaps that exist in Ontario? Good question. Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member is correct. The federal government has capped our provincial nominee program here in our province in 1,300. And the federal government could do better. Ontario deserves more. Ontario has little say from the federal government on economic immigrants who are selected to enter our province. Of the 99,000 people who immigrated to Ontario in 2012, we had a selection of less than 1.5 per cent. And that's not great, because you can, if you consider what's happening in Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan last year, the Alberta government had 11 per cent selection. Immigrants, uh, immigrant selection in Manitoba was 28 per cent in Alberta or sorry, Saskatchewan, it was 34 per cent. The Ontario Immigration Strategy spells out the need for Ontario to have greater say in selecting skilled immigrants here in our province. By selecting highly skilled immigrants to fill Answer. positions in our labour force, Ontario will be able to grow its workforce to create more jobs in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Many Ontarians don't, do not know that our province is not being given is not give, being given its fair share of PNP spaces. I understand the minister has written to the, his federal counterpart to request additional PNP spots. Many employers and investors are looking to come to Ontario and will be glad that our government is advocating for more selections through the PNP program. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please address the misconception that bringing in skilled immigrants to Ontario negatively it negatively contributes to our economy and to more unemployed Ontarians. Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Brampton West for his great question. Our government is committed to the economic growth and believes that an educated, skilled, and diverse workforce in Ontario is one of our greatest strengths. A diverse economy in our province is good for both Ontario and great for this country. It's about bringing the best and brightest here to our province. Since 2010. Ontario has nominated more than 2,000 international PhD and master's students for permanent residency through our provincial nominee program. 25 Ontario hospitals and health centres have used this program to retain specialist doctors and nurses to better provide health services here in our provinces. And half of Ontario's universities have used the program to retain world-class professors and deliver better education here in the province. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that the time has Answer. come for Ontario to redefine its shared immigration relationship with Ottawa so we can best position this province for success. Thank you. Here, here. Question, the member from Simple North. Training colleges and universities. Uh, this re weekend and this month, we are celebrating Small Business Week in Ontario. Small businesses, the heart and soul of job creation, are struggling to make ends meet here in, in Premier Wynne's Ontario. You've already taxed hardworking tradespeople by slapping a new 576% trade tax, courtesy of your Bay Street bureaucracy, the College of Trades. Section 7, Minister of the College of Trades Act, allows your College of Trades to tax employers for membership. Will you stand? Will you stand in the House today and promise employers that they will never have to pay the trades tax by the College of Trades? Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted to respond to that question. In fact, we were very, very clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, some time ago uh, when we waived that provision for employers so that employers are not paying membership. But I, I don't know why the member would want to confuse them today in almost making them believe that they are. Yeah. Member, me, employers are, are currently exempt, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to membership uh, for the College of Trades. We did that for good reason. Uh, but I'm pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, the College of Trades is up and running, and, and Mr. Speaker, they have indeed reduced ratios for, for apprenticeships more than any every government in this legislature on all sides of the House combined over the last 20 years. So, Mr. Speaker, they've made some great progress to date. We're confident that Answer. they'll continue to do that, and we're, confident they'll, well, we're very confident they'll continue to listen very carefully to the business community as they carry on their responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Minister. And you, you waived it for one year, 2013. Now we don't know what's happening after that. Only in Premier Wynne's Ontario, which slapping a new trades tax on employers 
be the best way to celebrate Small Business Week. Yeah. Meridian Credit Union, Ontario's largest credit union, recently conducted a small business survey with Harris Decima. The survey found 75% of Ontario small businesses in Premier Wins, Ontario, have no plans to hire people next year. Your trades tax on employers will further punish these small businesses. The difference is clear. The Ontario PCs on this side of the House stand up for small business in Ontario's yeah. Main Street. The Liberals on that side of the House stand up for their multi-million dollar College of Trades bureaucracy on Bay Street. Small Business Week is your golden opportunity, once and for all, to confirm that employers will never, never pay your trades tax. Yeah. Minister, it's Question. either Main Street or Bay Street. Will Main Street small businesses ever have to pay your Bay Street trades tax? Thank you. Thank you. Can you it, please? Can you it, please? Thank you. Minister. Rhetoric and fear-mongering aside, um, we, we very deliberately did not proclaim Section 7, and the member knows that. We have no intentions of doing so, Mr. Speaker. So, so we've been clear about that. We've, we've indicated that, uh, and I think that's important. But I suggest the member from time to time, and I, I think he's already had an opportunity. He's been able to contact the new chair, Mr. Speaker, of the of the College of Trades, David Tabucci, an esteemed former colleague uh, in this House, an esteemed former cabinet minister of his party. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very confident that Mr. Tabucci is going to do a fantastic job as our chair. I I would hope that the member opposite would share that confidence in this fine gentleman, a former colleague of his, who we think is going to do a tremendous job for the trades in the province of Ontario. We're very proud of how far the College of Trades has gone so far. A lot more work to be done, and we think Mr. Tabucci is just the fella to lead us there. Thank you. Question? Third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last Tuesday, I was invited out to the horse races in Fort Erie. It was a bittersweet day for the community because, in spite of the proud Niagara racing tradition, this Liberal government has decided that the Fort Erie racetrack doesn't deserve a 117th racing season. What does the Premier have to say to horse people, track workers and the community members about what her government plans to do to shut down horse racing at the Fort Erie racetrack? Premier. Well, let me, let me say, Mr. Speaker, categorically that that is not true. That I have every confidence that if Fort Erie Racetrack wants to develop a business plan and work with the OLG, they can have a future, Mr. Speaker, but it will be a different future than the present situation. That is the reality. We have said all along that the horse racing industry needed to change, that the slots at racetrack program was not accountable, was not sustainable. And let me just read what some of the people who are in the horse racing industry have said about our plan, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Ted Clark from Grand River Raceway, it's remarkable better than what our outlook was a year ago today. We essentially went from a place of having no relationship with government and no support to a place where we now have a spot to make a plan. This provides a new set of building blocks moving to move forward. We've been given some tools with which to work, and hopefully we can put them to good work. Mr. Speaker, the people Answer. in the industry see a way forward, and we are looking forward to working with them. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, nobody in Fort Erie can understand why the Liberal government has decided that their community doesn't deserve a viable future in horse race racing. Not track CEO Jim T. Bear or Fort Erie Mayor Doug Martin, not the jockeys or the concession stand workers, not the kitchen staff, the stable workers, maintenance, security, the mutual desk operators or the suppliers, not the horse owners, the fans or the bugler who calls out the post time and not the veteran groomer of 36 seasons who pulled me aside and asked me to deliver a simple message to the Premier. Will the government see the light and save horse racing at the historic Fort Erie racetrack? Premier. Premier. I'm trying not to make a crack about a violation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the, the panel who did an in-depth look at how we could put a sustainable pl uh, plan in place noted that they, that they urged the government to work with Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker, to develop an alternative, an alternative and sustainable plan. So there is no... Uh, there is nothing written in stone that says that Fort Erie doesn't have a future, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I 
understand the politics of what the leader of the third party is doing right now, Mr. Speaker. I understand that. But it is not responsible of us to suggest that something that is that, that has not been accountable, has not been transparent, which was the slots at racetrack program, that that's what should continue. We have got a plan in place, and Mr. Speaker, I have a copy of the plan here. I can send it over to the leader of the third party because the plan that was in place, the program that was in place was not sustainable. We put a sustainable plan in place. We look forward to working with Fort Erie so that they can put a new plan in place, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Question, the member from Scarborough, Agent Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister of Responsible for Seniors Affairs. Today, there are nearly 200,000 Ontarians who have a form of dementia. In my recent visit at Manjan Long-Term Care Facility, both the caregivers and the family expressed concern about dementia. As the Minister is well aware, statistics show that three out of five people with dementia will go missing at some point in time. Sadly, statistics also show that 50 per cent of those who go missing for 24 hours risk of serious risk of death or injury from exposure of hypothermia or drowning. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please explain to the Legislature what the government is doing to address this growing concern? Mr. Responsible for Seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My, uh, my thanks to the uh, member from Scarborough Edgy North for uh, her very deep understanding and compassion with respect to this very serious uh, issue. Uh, speaker, in March of this year, uh, we, in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, we launched a groundbreaking multicultural safety awareness program uh, named Finding Your Way uh, Wandering Prevention Program, aimed at people with dementia who may go wandering and go missing. As part of this program, Speaker, the Alzheimer's Society will distribute kits that include tips and resources to families and caregivers preventing wandering incidents and act quickly in cases of missing seniors. Our government is very committed, Speaker, in providing funding for the Ontario Police College to develop and deliver training that incorporates yes, wandering sir. prevention into police curriculum and for quick and better and effective response. Yeah, yeah. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his response. And I know that my constituents in Scarborough Agent Court across Ontario are pleased to hear that the government is taking action, increasing the safety of Ontarians with dementia. Mr. Speaker, during many meetings with constituents, I often hear about the initiatives such as the one the Minister talked about, Finding Your Way, Wandering Prevention Program. However, many family members and caregivers are unaware exactly what is in the kit, the Finding Your Way kits, assist in preventing wandering and enhancing community response when the senior goes missing. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please elaborate on the content of the wandering prevention kits? Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, speaker, the, uh, the safety kit uh, will help family and caregivers establish a plan to ensure the safety, independence and dignity of an individual. Uh, the kits, by the way, speaker, they are available in English, French, uh, Chinese and Punjabi. And they include a personal ID page that can be shared with police in an emergency, instructions on what to do when a person with uh, a dementia goes missing, the latest information on locating devices and instruction on how to safety proof your home and the immediate environment to prevent the person with dementia from going missing. As well, a list of important tips on what to do when they're reuniting, uh, when reunited after a missing incident. Speaker, Ontario can conduct uh, the Old Summers yes, uh, uh, Society, one of the 38 society across our province, through Ontario 211 to obtain a kit and as well, it's available from downloading it. Thank Speaker, you. thank you. Question. The leader of the, 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 leader of the opposition. Uh, so my question is to the, um, the Premier uh, around jobs and the economy. And, and Premier, as you know, the Fort Erie Racetrack is 116 years old. Wow. Uh, it survived uh, two world wars. It survived the Great Depression. But it's not going to survive the McGuinty win Liberal government. Uh, Premier, I look at everything for what it will do to create jobs, to grow our economy. You seem to want to close down the tracks and toss people out of work. And Premier, let me be absolutely clear about this. I fought for that track. I fought to keep it open. We gave it a 10-year lease on life, and I plan to do it again. So I hope that we're on the same page on this, but let me test that out. Folks in Fort Erie reject this notion of a festival meet, the notion of a small-town rural fair where you drive the ponies in, you drive them out. 
and you lose the jobs. That's not good enough for me. It's not good Question. enough for the industry. It's not good enough for the people of Niagara. Will you commit to a full racing season next year to give some life to this community Thank and you. give them their jobs? <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, so the starting point for this discussion is that the slots at racetrack program was not sustainable, it was not accountable, it was not going to be sustainable over the long term, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that we have a plan, Mr. Speaker. It's a five-year plan. It's a plan that was put together by people who spent a lot of time with the industry. And I agree with the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker. Fort Erie should have a future. The festival plan was one option that was put forward, Mr. Speaker. What I have said is that the government, the, uh, the Fort Erie needs to work with OLG to come up with an alternative business plan, Mr. Speaker, but to pretend that somehow what was in place was accountable and was sustainable over the long term is just not the case. And Mr. Speaker, John Drummond said that, and we needed to put a new plan in place, and we've got a new plan, Mr. Speaker. Now, hold on a second. That, that's where I was born and raised. We all have fond memories of track. We believe in a future for it. Premier, it was you that took the slots out of the track. It was you that ripped them out. It was you that tossed them out of work. And, and I think all of us are tired of the NDP pumping up on this issue because, quite frankly, they propped me up. They signed the deal, break their own paychecks. Half the job losses are on your back, and half the job losses are on your back. I'll wait. Thank you. Please finish. I fought for the track. I kept it open. I'm proud of that. I'm going to do it again. We got a plan to do so. I appointed Randy Pettipiece as our lead on this issue. He's got a plan. This is the track, according to your own Sedinsky report, with the second highest wagering in Ontario. It had 78 full race dates this past year. Your plan is Question. putting on a road to closure. So let me ask you this. You're the Minister of Agriculture as well as the Premier. Will you agree to sit down with Reddy Pettipiece and I to actually give life to that track, move it Thank forward, you. and ensure our sustainability? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have fought to get horse racing on a sustainable footing, Mr. Speaker. I have made it clear to the OLG that it will be integrated into the overall gaming strategy, Mr. Speaker, and that is what will put it on a sustainable footing, listen, Mr. Speaker. Listen, listen, and I know that the listen. member for Perth Wellington was at Grand River when we made the announcement, Mr. Speaker, and that he knows that the horse racing industry is on a more sustainable footing than it was a year ago, Mr. Speaker. The, uh the, uh, the, the chippy comments that come in as almost like a drive-by heckling is not helpful when I'm trying to get control, but also I, will, I know your voices by now and I know who to come to. So I'm asking that it stop and the member from the P and Carlton, please don't shout the, the Premier down. Thank you. Subject of festival meets, Mr. Speaker, I would just remind the Leader of the Opposition that the Kentucky Derby is a festival. Here, here. Thank you. You see it, please? Thank you. New question? <laughs> Member from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Last week, my constituent, Wes Bland, was in news across Ontario because of the roadblocks he faced in accessing a doctor ordered PET scan. Mr. Bland was forced to make the long six-hour drive to Thunder Bay instead of a much shorter trip to Winnipeg. My office has been in regular touch with the minister's office since September, alerting her to the urgency of Mr. Bland's case and the problems he was experiencing accessing cancer care. Can the minister please explain why her office didn't take steps to ensure that Mr. Bland could access the care he needed quickly and close to home, despite the minister's knowledge that he was being denied this care? 
Minister of Health, Long-Term well, Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I must say I'm a bit surprised at this question because she and I had a very good conversation, I thought, last week about what, what had happened and why this particular patient was unfortunately directed to the wrong place for the scan that he needed. Uh, speaker, um, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority has sent out uh, information to physicians in Manitoba that was not accurate. We've identified the problem and we've corrected that problem. I, I am absolutely committed, as I told the member last week, that everyone in this province get access to excellent care. And if they live in northwestern Ontario and that care is available in Manitoba, then we cover that care, Speaker. So if they can get the care, if they're entitled to the care here in Ontario, they will get it in Manitoba. Answer. So we've taken the appropriate steps to ensure this does not happen again. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the problem is this. Uh, first of all, I, I need to say I appreciate that the minister did take some time and talk to me about this issue. But the problem is that despite the minister's assurances that the problem is, quote, fixed or, as she just said, corrected, Manitoba Health continues to insist that Ontario patients will still have to seek prior approval for out-of-province procedures, such as PET scans, as stated in their memo. The minister has said that she has fixed the problem, but has she really fixed the problem when people will continue to wait weeks for approval? Approval for out-of-province PET scans, or when they're actually forced to go to the Toronto Star so that care is provided in a timely and close-to-home manner. Thank you. Well, Speaker, um, I, uh, I, I do my best to do my job in the province of Ontario. The best I know, my responsibility does not extend to the province of Manitoba. They have set up this rule in Manitoba, Speaker. It is their rule, not our rule. I am committed, as I told the member last week, to do what needs to be done at a ministry-to-ministry -ministry level to smooth that, uh, that system for the patients of northeastern Ontario. As I said earlier, northwestern Ontario. They deserve to get the care that someone in Ontario uh, is entitled to, Speaker, and if Manitoba is closer, that's where they get it. So we'll continue to work with the government of Manitoba and the, the uh, authorities there, Speaker, to make sure that the people in northwestern Ontario get the care they need. Thank you. Question, the member from Scarborough, Rouge River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Ontario's capacity to compete in the global knowledge-based economy depends on our ability to harness our research strengths, encourage innovation, and provide support to entrepreneurs. Local business leaders I've met with in Scarborough tell me that Ontario needs to remain a leader in the entrepreneurship to keep our economy strong, and this will create jobs for tomorrow. Given the challenges in the global economy, it is more important than ever that we take action that helps turn great ideas into thriving companies and new jobs. Speaker, can the minister tell us what action the government is taking to ensure that entrepreneurs are getting the support they need and that programs are easily accessible to them? Thank you, Minister of Inter Research thank, and Innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for that important question. Mr. Speaker, entrepreneurship and innovation are at the heart of our government's jobs and economy strategy. One of our initiatives is the Ontario Network of Entrepreneurs, made up of three networks, Mr. Speaker. First is our 57 small business enterprise centres that are located in municipalities and they help small businesses at the local level. The second one is our network of regional innovation centers, which uh, serves to coordinate the work of all actors at the regional level. And the third and last one is the business advisory service, which provides consultation and mentorship to, uh, to growth businesses. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud of our government's uh, investments in uh, which supports entrepreneurs and, uh, and innovators across our province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Don't uh, the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound on a point of order. Mr. So speaker, just a reminder that the Ontario Dental Association will be hosting a sports mouth guard fitting clinic in room 340 from 12 to 5 today. It's open to all MPPs and staff. And a further reminder that the legislators play their first game of the season this Thursday at 5 p.m. against the firefighters at the Rico Coliseum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.
you, the member from Bruce, uh, here on Bruce, on a Thank point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Amanda Garofalo to the Assembly. She is an uh, intern with the Ontario Legislative Intern Program, and it's great to have her working in here in Bruce. Thank you. Then I'll do my reminder, don't forget the wine tasting is this evening at 5 o'clock. Can't forget that. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Ontario wines. I think that's the purpose of what we're doing.